Okay, great to see you again. Just a couple of quick announcements. I, as usual, reviewed and graded your uh, second written assignment on Saturday morning, uh, and uh, uh, there were five people who missed the uh, deadline or were granted an extension, and I'll be done with those assignments, those late assignments by tonight. This week, you, you don't have a written reflection. The next written reflection will be in October, right? We're not going to have a written assignment every single week. This was just to get to know each other, to uh, bring your attention, uh, get you to focus on uh, the uh, important topics and the approach in this class. Fix my phone. So the assignments right now are just reading presentations and actual readings from the literature of the time, early 1900s, that emphasized the introduction of the new technology of the automobile. And this week we are going to go through a presentation about French science fiction writer Jules Verne, who used to be a best-selling author not just during his time, he started publishing in the 1860s, but up until the 1960s, for the next 100 years, virtually every generation of kid, kids read one or more books by Jules Verne in a variety of languages. He, he was translated in many languages. So I'm going to introduce the readings that uh, um, are part of your assignments and talk about his view of technology during today's class. Perhaps I'll add a few more things on Thursday. And on Thursday, we will conclude our examination of the Transformers series with the best film, in my opinion, in the series, uh, which is Bumblebee. Okay, and so we'll discuss Bumblebee and watch scenes from it. And that's it for now. I have also reviewed and provided feedback about your participation notes, the uh, comments that you left in class during last Thursday's class when we were watching the Transformers. They are here in alphabetical order by last name. So at the end of the class, I'll try to leave a few minutes, but collect yours, unless you did it online, in which case I provided comments online there as well. Inside the announcements, I explain they're not graded A, B, C, etc. through F. Uh, but if you go to the announcement, I explain the, the scale, which is basically excellent, very good, good, etc. So of course you find a lot of links inside this presentation. The links, unless it is specified expressly, are just there for your curiosity. Some of the links are articles about the author and his work, and others are direct links to copies of his books available on Google Books so that you can read some of the pages if you want, but also look at the illustrations, and the illustrations were a big part of the publication of these books, especially, as I said, because they were supposed to be books to be read by kids and young adults, um, also by adults, but moving from the 19th century to the 20th, the target age for readers uh, changed and went down age. So a lot of technology is introduced in the science fiction books by Jules Verne. Science fiction film uh, books were a relatively new genre in the second part of the 19th century. And you can find here just a small selection. So for example, in his book, From the Earth to the Moon, which 
appeared in 1865 and was one of his early big successful books. We find a <coughs> kind of a space train. So the idea in this book is that a group of people developed this project whereby they create a giant cannon that will shoot this projectile, which in fact is a kind of rocket. So thanks to the power of the explosion in the chambers of the cannon, the projectile, will be able to go past uh, the, the gravity, the force of gravity, propel into space, and get to the moon. And as you can see, I find it interesting that in the illustration, this kind of space technology, which was already a mix of old and new, because you have basically a giant piece of artillery and a giant projectile with cabins inside to house the travelers. So already you have a hybrid technology. Then it turns into what uh, essentially uh, looks like a train, right? With cabins for the passengers, something that looks like a caboose, and the, uh, the tip of this projectile, right? And of course, the travelers will go through a series of issues, technical issues. The patterns, the narrative patterns, the tropes you find in these books are the same you've encountered in a numerous uh, uh, group of films from the 20th century, right? Where you have the main issue, the main goal, the main mission, and then the rest of the narrative after the setup for the main mission is the heroes facing additional trouble, additional problems in order to complete their mission. Okay, 20,000 Leagues Under the Seas is another famous book by Jules Verne, where you find Captain Nemo, evil genius with technical skills that moves under the sea and around the world on an electrical submarine called Nautilus. And of course, uh, this what became later part of Disney. <coughs> Right? which confirms what I was saying, that it, it became common literature for children during the 20th century. You find a giant ship in a floating city, right? and you can gauge the size of this vessel by looking at the other boats fine here, but basically we have a ship with thousands and thousands of people, being able to live in it and travel across the world. And you can see that there isn't a lot of creativity at work in these books. Basically, it's a re-elaboration of existing technologies. The submarine was being uh, developed during the same period, and this is just a more advanced version of whatever submarines were about to be experimented during the Civil War in the United States in the, in the 1860s with the addition of electricity because electricity was the number one energy source in imaginary technologies during the period because of the already almost magical qualities of that technology. Same here, and this is something that I will come back to and show you other images. This is from a book called The Clipper of the Clouds, uh, which also has other titles, such as Robert the Conqueror, 
And this flying ship, this is basically a 19th century ship, iron ship, with giant propellers in front and the back, and a, a plethora of small propellers on the deck to keep the ship afloat in the air. Once again, the source of energy for this is electricity, and this helps Robber, the inventor slash uh, commander of the ship, travel quickly across the world and try his hand at global <coughs> domination. And this is the beginning of a trope that you will find in a lot of movies, especially during the 20th century, but even later from 007 to um, Austin Powers. And to confirm that illustrations were a big part of this kind of literature, this is an actual early edition, a first edition uh, of uh, Le Maître du, du, du Monde, uh, the Master of the World, which is the main book from which we will be reading, where you find a universal mobility vehicle, a vehicle that is able to move on the road, in the sky, on the surface of the water, and under the water. So it is essentially the combination of an automobile, a plane, a boat, and a submarine. And we're interested in this kind of reading because it reflects, even though it is from 1904, and this will be the last book published by Jules Verne, although not the, the last one to uh, carry his name, because more books will be printed in the next 15, 20 years. But in this book, you find a kind of outdated mindset and attitude towards the new technologies of mobility. That is to say, no matter how prodigious this vehicle is, it is still treated like an extension of trains and ships rather than the individual technology for mobility that the automobile will turn out to be. And in here you find also the illustration inside, for example, in the frontispiece you see the Dormian Volcano, a fictional mountain in North Carolina where the novel begins because people start hearing noises coming from the top of this mountain and they all believe they go into a panic, they all believe that uh, the volcano is about to erupt again, and they're afraid for their lives. In fact, the sounds they hear is just the construction of this vehicle, which, interestingly, uh, is called the Terror, the Pouvant. in French. And in here, right before the beginning of the book, you find the protagonist, John Strzok, who's represented as an officer of a federal agency that is not specified, but think of the 19th century version of the FBI. And while he's thinking, of course, we want to know what he is deep in thought about and we find it in the rest of this illustration. First, here we find the road version of the terror traveling very fast on the road and so fast that in fact you have a cloud of dust following, a trail of dust following the vehicle because of course we're talking about 19th century roads. So they're paved road, dirt road. And one of the things you'll read about this vehicle is that it goes so fast that it changes the perception of matter. Matter uh, and weight are defeated by the very speed of the vehicle who appears to move very lightly. But if you watch above, you'll see the flying version of this vehicle and you'll see that the way it moves through the air is with wings that are like bird wings 
the vehicle flaps its wings and the vehicle moves thanks to electricity. Only this time the book specifies that electricity is gathered, collected from the air itself. So the vessel includes a technology that allows it to recharge the batteries from the air itself and therefore can keep going forever. But essentially this thing, as you will see from the models, is big enough that it is not an individual means of transportation. It requires a crew. It requires a commander. It is uh, steered and manned like more like a ship, right? And therefore, not something from which you would expect a social disruption, a, dis a, disrupt a disruption of society. Of course, in the back, you see this idea of the dark clouds and the eruption of the volcano, and we'll talk about the anticipation of the technology. The fact that before the technology is introduced in these books, you have this um, dark atmosphere, uh, this uh, uh, ominous signs, the anticipation of something that will bring a change that can be so radical and dramatic that can be seen as negative. And then below, you see the vehicle going from the bottom of the ocean to the surface, right? So you know that it can travel underwater and above water. But more importantly, this time, you see how the vehicle disrupts commercial traffic, right? Uh, because you have fishermen uh, whose boats are um, endangered by the operation of the terror and this is one of the themes in the book this idea that this disruptive technology is a threat to society as a whole but especially to the uh, crucial parts crucial components of society politics the economy uh, the circulation of news etc everything has to be managed And in here, Strzok is represented as an old man, but there is no indication that he's so old. Once again, in this illustration, you see the vehicle, you can barely make out the shape of the vehicle traveling so fast in the road, and you see how disruptive the technology is. You see a carriage with a horse being thrown into a ditch. So already from the illustrations, you get the idea of this negative, pessimistic, representation of the new technologies that are coming, that writers feel will be in the future of humanity, um, and also a moralistic view of these technologies, right? Because this is not a deep, uh, uh, thoughtful consideration of the technologies, just the most superficial representation of the bad consequences of these new technologies not to mention that they're being uh, produced and used and abused by evil inventors. And in fact, we'll talk of how Robert, uh, the inventor of this technology, is also in some ways the prototype of the lone man inventor, but also the madman evil inventor that you find in a lot of films up until and including Dr. Evil, right? Which is a parody exactly of that kind of character. Madison. Wasn't that prototype that's fallen decades prior with one of the first sci-fi books, Mary Shelley's modern Prometheus, even if... Yeah, it, it, in some ways, yes, definitely. Because... In but not as prominently in that kind of literature, yeah. whereas in here, Rob is the antagonist. There, he was a college dropout. What would you... I'm sorry, who's, who's a college dropout? Oh, uh, no, no. Oh. Victor Frankenstein in the original book was a college student that isolated himself in order to create the monster over the span of eight months, and then afterwards, the trauma of the event resulted in him dropping out of college. Okay. Bad decision, good decision? Uh, so so. It's up okay. to the It's to, to, be, to be determined. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of the moralistic view of the disruption caused by the technology, look at this illustration. And this time, finally, we are at the first chapter, page one of the novel, and you see this idyllic, archaic view of the rural 
territories of North Carolina. Jules Verne had visited the US, but he gathered information about these areas, mostly from illustrated travel magazines and books. So you have this uh, unspoiled natural land where everything is about to change under the threat of caused by the operations of this machine which will be based at least initially inside the empty the hollow tip of this volcano that you see here called the Great Erie but the name sounds American but in fact it's made up uh, we, we have an idea of where it is located, but the locales, the towns, are for the most part an invention. Right, and you see a traditional carriage going a leisurely play, play pace on this rural road, and you see woods, and you see beautiful mountains. Okay, this is before the technology comes in to change this situation. And then in this illustration, you see the reflection of what I was saying before about mass media, the idea that society as a core of educated citizens who are able to absorb the news, read and hear and understand the news, and in here they're all worried about what they are, of, of the incidents that they heard caused by this new technology, and look how many of them have newspapers in their hands. But the underlying idea is that there must be a leadership that is able to handle the delivery of the news so that the people are, who are reading are influenced in a positive way. They're instructed on how to correctly, appropriately react to news that can be dramatic. Right, so there is this conservative idea of society. Basically, there is an upper echelon, the leaders, those who decide. Right after them, you have the people such as John Strzok, the federal officer who's chasing after Robur and eventually will manage to bring him down, although Robur will not be arrested and we don't even know whether he dies. But the writer dies, and so there is no sequel. So the people who work in association with the leadership. Then you have the middle class, which at this point in society is a big chunk of society. And those need to be manipulated more than guided. They need to be influenced and educated in the right way. And then you have the bottom of society, the proletarians, the factory workers, those without education, who work with their hands, and those are practically considered savages, beasts, with animalistic reactions, with big fears, big emotions, and they are those who react more emotionally to the introduction of new technologies, and therefore they need to be controlled. It's not a matter of influencing them, they need to be guided with a firm hand, they need to be told what to think and what to feel. And this is the vehicle itself at rest in the crater of the mountain. You see the, the walls uh, and you see the birds of prey flying over it. And you see what I was saying before, it looks like a vehicle or a big automobile, but it is in fact more similar to a ship with wheels and wings, with an entire crew, with different functions and different roles aboard the ship, aboard the vessel, taken by different members of uh, the crew. And therefore, we can see how Jules Verne, who by the time he wrote this was old and famous and rich, by the standards of the time, writers wouldn't make as much, even with best-selling books, as, as they do uh, today. How Verne failed to understand the revolutionary, the radically innovative components, elements of the new technologies of mobilities, namely the automobile, and he turned 
the automobile in something that is like a, a, a better version of the train, the boat, the submarine, the plane. See here, for example, so you have a driver here, but there are various hatches, etc. And you see the shape uh, uh, that uh, this vehicle will get when going on water or underwater and right now the wings are folded to the sides. This is what we saw before, just a different version of the disruption caused in the Great Lakes, uh, how the new technology interferes with the regular activities of fishermen or boats that are bringing supplies across the lake. Here you have, if you can see in this gorge, uh, the previous vessel created, the flying ship created by Robert in the prequel, in the first novel, because at this point we have the revelation that the same man who created this flying ship and who disappeared and was believed to be dead at the end of that novel has returned with a more developed version of this. There are about 20 years between the two novels. So this is very 19th century, but even the next one is still very much tied to an ideology and mindset uh, that by 1904 was outdated. And this is why I chose to begin with this because it's a good transition, okay? And um, you may know that there are people who create models for museums and sometimes kits for collectors. In this case, we have Jean-Marc Deschamps who recreated some of uh, the vessels from the stories of Jules Verne that we're about to read from, so you can uh, visit the website where I took these images, but right now you can just look at these wonderful models, right? These are 3D models, even though the picture makes it look like an illustration. But this is a 3D model of the flying ship, where you can see that very well the two propellers in front and the back with a kind of rudimentary rudder. You can see the uh, the, the, the appendages that will be used by the ship to land and steady itself because you still have a hull, which is essentially the hull of a ship. And you can see the dozens of propellers on the bridge of the ship that are supposed to keep it afloat. With the various quarters of the commander and the crew, as well as cabin in the hull. Right? There is uh, an harpoon cannon, and there, are, uh, there is a, a, a real gun, a cannon, in here. Uh, there was a film made in, I believe, 1961, 60 or 61, based on this flying ship, and loosely based on the story by Jules Verne, where they go to places around the world, and they start hitting the ground with projectiles from these cannons. You can see a view from above and different views. I've included some information, some details about the life of Jules Verne, uh, taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica article entry on him. He was born in 1828, initiated his professional career as a stockbroker, was active uh, as a professional before he made it as a writer in the 1860s. And although his first manuscript was rejected, never published and only published later on in the 1990s, but we will read from it because it represents Paris in the 20th century as a city with vehicles that are exactly like automobile. Although that first novel was not uh, accepted, the next ones were all big hits.
for example, five weeks in a balloon, which has been made in cinematic versions or made for TV movies a number of times. And he published often with this publisher called SO. And you can recognize at least some of the titles. Paris in the 20th century is the first manuscript that was rejected and then published only, found and published in 1994. But you can recognize the journey to the center of the earth that too uh, found in plenty of films from the last 60 or 70 years, from the earth to the moon that I mentioned, uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea, or around the world in 80 days. The Encyclopedia Britannica entry makes a distinction between the first 20 or 25 years of Jules Verne production where he seems to have a more adventurous view of new technologies. Uh, they come out as exciting in the books. Whereas during the last part of his life from 1886 until he died in 1905, the year after he published the book, we'll read from The Master of the World, often the view of technology is affected by pessimism and by a moralistic view of society and men in general. There is a third period because, as I suggested before, after he died in 1905, for sure there were some manuscripts left in his drawers, but we also know at this point that when, during the, la the next 20, 15 years, his son Michael published books under his father's name, often those books were the result of the uh, son of Jules Verne's efforts. And therefore, they're not authentically uh, the work of Jules Verne. They may have derived from drafts, notes, just simple ideas that were found after his death, but they're not entirely his work. He wrote a lot. Some books are just about adventures in general. A lot are about exotic explorations which reflect what was going on in the world during the 19th century. A lot of explorers were still active in various areas of the world, especially Asia and Africa. What we're interested in is a group of books by Jules Verne that can be classified as technological fiction with some elements of dark science, meaning science to, uh, that, that serves evil purposes. And it's serialized literature, right? It's literature that is commercial, right? Uh, they, they want to entertain the reader, minimally educate the reader, mostly entertain the reader. They want to sell as many books as possible. They want to produce as many books as possible. And therefore, they rely on narrative patterns, on formulaic templates, so that these books once you have the core idea can be executed from the core idea to the full book, you can go as quickly as possible. So what, what is typical of these simple templates? And think of modern films, films, I use modern in a loose way, from the last 60 or 70 years. What is typical of a lot of adventurous films and also science fiction films. The opening, the setup is very intricate, intricate, uh, complex, but the conclusion is kind of hard. It seems that by the time the story comes to a conclusion, a lot of things are left unresolved or are resolved, they are resolved in a very mechanical way, in a simplistic way, whereas the, the opening suggested a very complex, interesting story. In the case of the technological fiction uh, products by works by Jules Verne, this is often 
what we find, and this is certainly true of the two books about robots. Initially, you find an aura of mystery and suspicion. So the beginning, at the beginning, we don't know how the story will develop. We only know that there are some signs, some manifestations of the technology that cannot be explained by the people in the book. And the reader itself is left clueless to how the story will exactly develop. So before the technology, there is a dark part, a dark theme that has already been introduced. Then oftentimes the experience and the description of the technology happens through the trope of the abduction. That is to say there are main characters, in the case of John Strzok is one character, in another case in the prequel uh, it's a group of characters, that are abducted by the evil inventor, by the scientist slash madman, taken on board the technology, and they're not kept just as prisoners. They're free to go around, and therefore, during their captivity, they experience the technology. And whether they like it or not, and of course, they're being, they've been kidnapped, essentially, so they start very angry, but then they get to know the inventor, they find the inventor to be brilliant, even though evil, so they're somewhat charmed, seducted by both the mind of the inventor and the technology created by him, and they're relatively free to experience this technology for a fairly long period of time, so they come to appreciate the technology a lot. So during this period, they experience this kind of fascination for the technology. The end, of course, since, as we said, there is a moralistic plot. The end is usually the destruction of the technology. But again, think of how many films from 007 to uh, Austin Powers and everything in between end with the destruction of uh, a secret base from which someone was trying to achieve global domination with some strange technology, a laser from the moon, give me a million dollars. And uh, the destruction is followed by a moral lesson. In case you haven't gotten the fact that destruction is what the technology deserved because it was created by the evil mind of a madman, there is also either a speech or a reflection for the readers to uh, make the morality of the story explicit. And finally, there is an appendix, a quick uh, epilogue, where the main characters return to their normal regular lives with a question mark, meaning that they try to go back to their normal life, but nothing is exactly as it was before, because the conclusion has to leave the possibility for a sequel. If the book sold enough copies, they would try to make another episode, which is the reason why Robert seems to die, the inventor seems to die at the end of each novel, but there is never enough evidence that he actually died. And therefore, not only there is the possibility that he will come back, but even if he were to be dead, there is the possibility that the technology will come back. If someone created it, someone else can replicate their, uh, uh, this, this feat uh, and come back. And therefore, there is this dark cloud, even in the epilogue, even after the evil deeds of the inventor have been punished and the technology has been destroyed to protect and preserve peace and serenity in the world, there is this sense that the world is not safe from the possibility of someone else restoring or recreating this technology and therefore uh, uh, precipitating once again society into chaos. This is from the first novel, Robert the Conqueror, is the most common title and the French title, Robert le Conquerant. And, and you see here the, the vessel, the flying ship uh, that we saw before. These are 
powerful lights that illuminate the ground. And of course, in front, in a prominent position, you find the madman, the inventor, the leader. Underneath, you find society. And of course, you see, first of all, you find a lot of bourgeois, affluent people with their typical hats, the tall hats of the 19th century, because the idea is that whoever is in power, politically or economically, has reason to be afraid that this new technology will create a situation of anarchy and maybe enough chaos that the structures, the hierarchy of society will be changed. So in this particular novel from 1886, with the same antagonist, Rob Boer, uh, you have at the beginning the anticipation and the dark theme connected to the anticipation of the technology. There are some signs and a lot of confusion. Uh, they know that someone with a vessel equipped with fantastic speed almost has the gift of ubiquity, which means being in two places at the same time, leaves these clues to its existence. People can hear music and noise from above, but they cannot identify the source. There are flags that are found on top of monuments and buildings that are not easy to reach, so we know that someone is flying in the air in 1886 before planes, leaving this, and it cannot be just an hot hair balloon or a dirigible because they don't have the speed uh, that is uh, associated with this particular vehicle. Then, before the introduction of the technology, we have a chapter with a debate among people who are experimenting with flying vessels. And there are two groups, uh, two factions with different ideas about flying. Some uh, support the idea of a lighter than air mobility vessel, so something like an you know, air balloon or a dirigible, and others uh, think instead that what should be developed is something that is heavier than air, so some kind of plane. And following this event, some of the lead experts and the innovation leaders of this fictional American institute are kidnapped, the abduction trope, and they found themselves on board this flying ship. And therefore, the following section is a demo of the technology. Okay. So, the hostages, the people from the debate in Philadelphia, are taken around the world for three weeks on this flying ship. That's the abduction part of the template. They are captivated by the technology and by the inventor. That's the seduction part of the pattern of the technology narrative. Finally, they are able to escape, and they are responsible for the destruction of the vessel, and that's the destruction part of the technology, which is typical in these novels. The conclusion describes the inaugural flight of a new dirigible called Go Ahead, but the new ship, the name of the ship is Albatross, a second uh, albatross appears in the sky. There is a duel between the dirigible and the flying ship. The dirigible is about to crash to the ground. They're rescued by the albatross. And before leaving, Robert gives a speech which reveals the moralistic view of technology in these narratives. And I have excerpted passages of the speech by Robert, which marks the conclusion of the book. Citizens of the United States, my experiment is finished. Notice the preachy tone, right? That's why we can call it moralistic. 
But my advice to those present is to be premature in nothing, not even in progress. So stability, order are more important than technological progress, which is another moralistic view of technology. It is evolution and not revolution that we should seek. In a word, we must not be before our time. So there is a time for everything, but who's to decide? The governments, the leaders, right? The top echelon of society. I have come too soon today to withstand such contradictory and divided interests as yours. So, humanity is not mature enough to embrace and adopt these technologies. So, there is a view from the top of the development of technology and society. Nations are not yet fit for union. Well, there is this idea uh, that you find here and there in the 19th century and then more often later on of a global government, of a global federation that should accompany the development of very advanced technologies, right? And there are plenty of films where this, or TV series, right? Think of Star Trek where this is realized. And this is the conclusion of the speech. I go then, and I take my secret with me. But it will not be lost to humanity, which is almost a threat. It will belong to you the day you are educated enough to profit by it, and wise enough not to abuse it. Citizens of the United States, goodbye. The Frenchman, uh, talking through an evil inventor to American fictional citizens, right? And the, the, the ships, the flying ship disappears, and now you have the epilogue. Are we able to go back to normal after such an event? Of course not. And now, the narrator says, who is this robber? Shall we ever know? We know today, robber is the science of the future. So it doesn't matter whether he uh, perishes or not. Perhaps the science of tomorrow, certainly the science that will come. Does the albatross still cruise in the atmosphere in the realm that none can take from her? Etc. Etc. And uh, would Robert the Conqueror appear one day as he said? Yes, he will come to declare the secret of his invention, which will greatly change the social and political conditions of the world. So this negative view of technology as something that holds control of you. The abduction trope is not just people being taken hostages. It's this idea that the technology comes and takes control of society, of your mind, of your life, and you're not free. You're not more powerful, you're not empowered by the technology or set free by the technology because the technology controls you. So you become less human, more machine. You become the extension of the technology, etc. Which is a view that will propagate during the next generations. So, Master of the World, 1904. The, the story is set in 1903. The locations include North Carolina, the Blue Ridge Mountains, you can click and see it on Google Maps, the Great Lakes, the Caribbean, where the uh, terror will come to, to crash, will be destroyed. The hero, in a positive sense, is John Strzok, head inspector in the Federal Police Department of Washington. Okay, And initially there are as usual, the, in the anticipation, apparitions of Robert's new machine, which are considered to be disruptive, make people wonder first what it is. Then they wonder about the existence of three machines or four, one per context. One that goes on the road, one that goes on the water, under, in the sky, etc. There is the abduction, because Strzok while trying to arrest Robert, will be taken on board the terror, the terror will leave, he wakes up and he's allowed to explore the machine, which is typical again of these films, that the people who are 
taken and are never just put in a cell and left there or killed, as Coffee says, let's kill him now. No, they're placed in a situation where they can both experience the technology and then interfere with its operation, right? And there is the, re the, the moment of recognition when we know that Robur is still alive and from the previous novel and has uh, come back with a new technology. So the narrative pattern, as usual, is marked through the steps of mystery, the anticipation, followed by the abduction, while hostage to Robert, John Strzok will experience the seduction both of the technology and the mastermind behind the technology. There will be the destruction of the technology and a conclusion which uh, includes a partial return to normalcy because nothing can be quite normal after this. At the conclusion, you have this storm that will cause the destruction of the machine, and John Strzok will go home, back to his life, and Robert will simply be missing in action, with the conclusion being opened to a third novel, but the third novel will never come because the writer will uh, die. Um, okay, I can skip some of these things, and you can just read about it. I've formatted in bold bleeding edge of technological change because the metaphor tells you that the bleeding edge of a new technology is the period where you experience uh, the, the positive impact but also some setbacks, right? Because it's such a new technology and this is very true for this kind of narrative and I've included my favorite character, Dr. Evil, because he's the comedic culmination of the uh, development of this kind of character. And that's when he's saying, can I have a hug? So, keep in mind when you look at this character that you have a global context that this technology will affect humanity on a global scale that there is a struggle for global power and global domination that's the new element uh, that marks this kind of narrative that makes Robert the earliest prototype for this kind of character what's interesting what you find in these novels and then in plenty of films is the seclusion and separation of the inventor from society, right? So, the madman, the scientist, the inventor comes from a mysterious segment of society, comes from another world, right? Certainly doesn't come from a regular urban area, doesn't come out of the industrial network. And therefore, we have to wonder, and it's easy to answer film by film, story by story, is this really a new industrial technology that can be produced serially? Or is it simply a unique prototype every time created by a single individual with a lot of talent in something that would be more similar to a small shop or a lab, right? Think, for example, about Back to the Future. That would be a good example. Small lab, big technology. In our case, for the literature of the automobile, uh, I'll be talking about the black motor car by British writer John Berland, published in 1905, where again you have this uh, tremendously fast automobile, which is also huge, uh, like 12, uh, no, six meters would be, what, 18 feet or so. 
which comes out of a small shop, even though it is described like an industrial product. So there is clearly this kind of contradiction. It doesn't look artisanal, it looks industrial, but we don't necessarily see the industry behind it. The interactions between the madman, the inventor, and the rest of the world are always unusual, irregular, in these kinds of stories that we'll be reading from and other stories you can think of. In this case, there are the enigmatic signs at the beginning, the sounds, the noises, the music coming from above, the flags being left on top of monuments, then followed by letters in a prophetic style, and then debates with a physical confrontation in uh, various parts of these books. In here you can click and you can find the letter sent by the inventor to John Strzok and another letter sent to various governments, which is typical, including Dr. Evil, asking for his uh, typical $1 million ransom. Of course, in this kind of literature, as well as the films following the same pattern, you find a lot of narrative gaps, things that are never explained, right? Typical of every film. Who are the henchmen? Where do they come from? Where do they live? How were they selected and trained? And sometimes in these films you find large numbers of that. Again, think 007, think other films from the 1960s and 70s especially. And how was the new te miraculous technological device produced? Where, how did they get the resources, the materials, etc.? And almost in every case, we find a technology that is shown as ready, right? It's a new technology, but there are no signs of a development there are no bugs or glitches, usually it just works perfectly until it is destroyed. In terms of the mad inventor, one of the typical qualities of the profile of this kind of character in these books, as well as other examples, more modern examples, is that the mad inventor is a sinner, right? A negative character evil in some way, yet at the same time is also a charming character, seductive in some ways. So we can call him a tech deviant engineer or, or inventor, and usually we find a lot of these qualities is temperamental, can change his mind quickly, narcissistic of course, has a big ego, a big personality, but also charismatic many ways. He is, of course, a, the kind of character that shows a lot of hubris, a lot of arrogance, has grandiose plan that either directly or indirectly will cause social changes. And in one way or the other, the main character is opposed to the established social order and promoting change through a period of anarchy and chaos. We can find in these books by, by Jules Verne signs of an incomplete transition from analog technologies, mechanical technologies, to electrical and digital technologies. Because clearly there are numerous traces of the old world, the analog world. For example, the fact that in the prequel, the albatross, the flying ship, is essentially a traditional ship with the addition of propellers in front and on the deck. Or think of the fact that the terror has wings that flap, right? Which you find in notebooks by Leonardo da Vinci, for example. So nothing particularly new there. At the same time, there are signs of an approach that reminds us of digital technology, because there are 
qualities that are magical or supernatural in these narratives. The fact that these vessels are virtually ubiquitous. They can move so quickly that they can go from one place to another so quickly that it's like there is no in-between. So their mobility, again, is defined on a global scale. It's not something you use to move from point A or B. And in terms of energy, they have an endless reserve of energy. They don't need to refuel, they don't need to recharge. Either nothing is said about recharging, or we know that they magically recharge from electricity that exists in the air. In terms of pre-modern element, we find in the description of the vessels, the albatross as well as the terror, that the decor, including the furniture, is bourgeois decor, middle class furniture. And the end result, it's almost at the level of the steampunk genre. Look, for example, this 1902, so two years before the novel, The Master of the World, representation of a night of, at the opera in Paris with people leaving the theaters and flying around Paris in a variety of flying vessels shaped like birds, like, like fish, right? So this combination of very advanced flying technologies and natural shapes. Are we all right? Do we have any Prozac, Xanax? Because I'm feeling depressed from the vibe in the <laughs> class. Okay. Feel free to interrupt with comments or questions. I mean, let's try to pick it up and, and get to the end of the class without clinical depression. So, okay, you, you can read some of these things yourself. Let me skip ahead. Let's talk about the tech virgin that you find here and then you'll find in a lot of films and books in the 20th century. There are two ways to emphasize the function of the main character in a story of discovery, right? So you have someone who has never been exposed to a new technology, and you could just describe, discuss their fresh experiences with this new reality, with this new technology. Instead of doing that, in Jules Verne, as well as in a number of films and books of the 20th century, they choose another approach whereby you have a tech expert and a tech virgin, where the interaction between these two characters emphasizes how advanced the technology is and how strong the emotional, physical, psychological reaction to the technology is. So the advanced quality of the technologies are conveyed by the expert character. And the size of the reactions to the technology are conveyed through the innocent character who gets to experience the technology for the first time. And you can repeat this in any number of contexts. It doesn't have to be technology. It could be, for example, in a war movies, in a cop movies, where you put the veteran cop or the veteran soldier and the recruit, the latest addition to the platoon, to the company. So you have both sides of the experience, the character who shows the depth and the complexity of the experience of being at war or being a cop, and you have the emotional depth, the emotional complexity that you live as a reader through the character who's never been exposed to this reality. So, in this case, you have someone, even John Strzok is the tech virgin because he's never experienced this technology and he becomes a co-traveler. That's the important part. Not only is he taken hostage on board the technology, but he gets to leave the technology together with the inventor and therefore he's also a sidekick or a potential ally because it's clear that 
John Strzok or other characters in the previous novel could become associated robber. That robber could be charming enough and seductive enough that they leave the regular position they occupy in society and, and, and fully embrace this new adventure with the new technology and become accomplices to the inventor. Okay, so the tech virgin character has a lot of interest in the new technology, clearly, feels the influence of the big dreams associated with the technology, which you also find in a lot of these films, including 007. 007 himself is sometimes co-opted and then charmed to the point where you wonder whether he might embrace the other side. But you always go through this simple cycle. Attraction to the technology and the creator, captivation, both in a physical and a psychological way, but then rejection, finally. Yes, please. Would you say that this tech virgin character also sort of doubles as a audience insert? So there's yes, yes, of course. It's, it's he, the tech version is modeling what the reactions of the readers should be. Right, yes. And also creating a... A, a, an easy empathy channel, right? Because the reader is as naive as this character in these stories, okay? So uh, the acceptance of the technology goes through a spectrum whereby you have reflection, you have attraction, of course, but then you have repentance and criticism of the technology, and finally this is followed by the facts, right? The condemnation and the destruction of the technology. When the tech virgin goes back to their regular life, they realize that they had, have suffered a loss of innocence, that in fact they cannot experience the world in the same way simply because the technology has been destroyed, right? The same way that if uh, uh, a dictatorship were established in the United States and all the cell phones were seized and taken from you, you wouldn't be able to go back to your regular life. And a lot of this can be seen in a variety of contexts. Think of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, right? Sherlock Holmes is brilliant, Dr. Watson is a doctor, but quite stupid as a character. Always following, always unable to understand what his companion is doing during the investigation. But the same could be said about Fifty Shades of uh, Darkness, right? What is it? Fifty Shades of what? Fifty Shades, right? You, you know the novels, right? The Fifty Shades of Grey, yeah. whatever. Oh, it's the trilogy. Right? You know Fifty Shades. So there too, what is the key to the success of the narrative? The fact that you have the expert as S&M practices, right? A super expert, uh, the millionaire, uh, no, what, is, what is the name? Gray, Chris Gray, or whatever. Yeah. And, and you have a sex virgin, right? Or S&M virgin, so a character who's never been introduced to these sexual practices, and therefore you have the depth of the techniques on one side in one character, and the depth of the reactions in the other character who's never experienced these things. Yes? As a fact, as a matter of fact, I'd say Fifty Shades is probably the most prominent example of literary cliches being put one on top of the other, because in the original, like probably first drafts of the story, it outright featured characters from the Stephanie Meyer series, Twilight series. Right, yes, exactly, yeah. So it was a complete change, but it worked, right? They sold millions of copies all over the world. But you find the same duality of characters, right? The expert character, the naive character. One to provide the technical side, the other to provide the emotional reactions or the physical reactions, etc. 